Anyway, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the capturing and uh, utilization of the nutrients, and I'm going to talk about it a lot from the standpoint of people that have moved from open feedlots to these types of facilities, some of the things that are different, some of the considerations that you need to make that are, are going to make things. Some of the big differences, um, with an open feedlot, you can uh, do chores probably once every six months as far as scraping and cleaning out the barns or cleaning out the pens and so forth. It needs to be very timely in these barns. Um, so it becomes part of weekly chores. Uh, also, you are in close proximity with the cap. Um, when you're moving, moving in there with equipment, and I take it nobody wants to scrape these barns by hand, right? Okay, you're going to be in there with the cattle. Um, different cattle are going to behave differently, but oftentimes they become more and more accustomed to the uh, tractors, the equipment in there, and there's a tendency to bump them, especially late late in the uh, feeding period when you've got all the money and so forth in, and uh, you got to be very, very careful and think about what you're doing, think about the way you design these so that you can clean out the manure on a regular basis and not injure the cattle, especially when they're ready to go on the truck tomorrow. As far as the nutrients that are out there, I guess I'm going to think about them in terms of where they're coming from, and we have the two different types. We've got the, the part that's coming out of the urine, um, which is going to be mostly all our potassium, very soluble. In the open lots, a lot of times that is lost through, through runoff that comes off the top. We're going to be able to cap, capture that. It does attach quickly to exchange sites, so some of the soil and so forth under an open lot will have it. Otherwise, we're going to be capturing that with our bedding. Ammonia, and we've done the study, it can but volatilize, and oftentimes if you're losing very much ammonia, from just your standpoint, you can smell. If you can smell it a lot, that probably means that we've got it leaving. It also will attach to the exchange sites on things. Uh, cattle produce a lot of feces or the organic matter. That part's probably always or very often going to be all captured in our uh, facilities. That's the part that takes some additional breakdown in order for our plants to use it. And it actually contains lots of exchange sites. And so if you've got a, a piece of property that you've applied manure on year after year, oftentimes you'll, you'll see that it's able to retain more. It has a higher organic matter in it. That's because that's where it came from. If we take a look at, at how much the animals produce versus how much we're able to capture in the different systems. Um, reason why we get the bedded barns, we're probably going to be adding around a, a bale, a 1, thousand to twelve hundred pounds of additional material out there to soak up that urine, uh, keep things dry, and that's why we have a, a higher amount here in terms of the capture versus the open lot. Uh, on a, a deep pit, um, we put things down here, and this is, I get a lot of people asking me when they've done some manure analysis, why do you have so much more captured from a deep pit? And it's really just a matter of how we measure it. Okay, this is measured in pounds per thousand gallons. There is in a thousand gallons, there are four tons of material. So these are actually going to be, roughly speaking, four times as great as this because of the difference in the way that we're actually measuring them. When people are building uh, 
livestock facilities for uh, cattle. Um, one of the things that salesmen often talk about the cost per head space on their facilities. I guess I'd like you to take a look at it in terms of cost per square foot so that you can evaluate all of these on, I'll say, the same basis. And also when we move cattle into facilities, the facilities are relatively speaking expensive. And so we squeeze more animals into less space. Um, we're normally down in, in the lower end of this, I'll say at least uh, uh, 40 square feet per head. At 40 square feet per head, the amount of urine that you get on a daily basis is a quarter inch. Okay? That's with little cap. That is as much as we get in terms of evaporation on the warm days. So a lot of times we're going to have them in here dense enough that you're going to keep everything wet. I put this into the paper and it's also up here at the various stocking densities, how much depth of manure do you get in a week and think then about how frequently you're going to scrape and get that cleaned up. Okay? And over time uh, that I've been with Iowa State University Extension Service, we moved from finished cattle that were 900 to 1,000 head. Now I, I see 14, 1,500 pound cattle routinely being that big before they're going to market. When they're that big, they produce a lot more manure. We've done some things in terms of feeding so that we can still put on muscle on those uh, big animals, but they're eating a lot of feed, they're gaining a lot of weight, and they're producing a lot of manure. If they're in tight, tight, uh, positions, we're looking at a lot of manure being produced. Uh, large cattle, we're looking at over five inches per week. Okay. And if you have a cleaning schedule that's on here, the difference between the big cattle and the little cattle, and at the end of the feeding period, you need to be on it on, <laughs> on your schedule or adjust your schedule so you, you can be on it because being one or two days late is the difference between having cattle that are clean and nice and are able to keep their hair coat and those that aren't. This is uh, why we use the bedding, help soak up the manure, keep the cattle clean, okay? Change the uh, manure from a semi or slurry into a semi-solid that we're able to handle something that's at least 80% uh, water. That sounds like a lot, right? 20% solids, 80% water. That will stand up nicely in a manure strip. Okay? If it gets higher than that, it runs out the back gate. Um, what are the considerations? Of course, bedding has cost involved with it, and it's gotten higher over time, and especially in years when you have a late wet season when you need bedding the most, it's going to be the hardest to make, and if you can't make it, nobody else did, and it's going to be very expensive. So just put that on your, your thing. Every time you handle it, it costs more money. Storing it costs some money, and of course processing helps to improve the surface area so you can soak that stuff, the urine up quickly, but of course that costs more money. Uh, where do you want to store it? Uh, of course, you want to oftentimes have it very close to the barn, um, and you'd like to keep it high and dry so that you have as le the least amount of store spoilage as possible. And here, we've got it high and dry. Now, uh, with, uh, with these, if you are slow and late, or also, I'll say, you, you You've got to make sure that you evaluate how good the quality is of the bedding, especially late in the year when we've had some de decomposition of it. You might need to add a few bales so we don't end up with, uh, with uh, cattle that have lost their hair coat 
they lose the hair coat, then they're also going to have to use more of their the feed to control their body temperature, especially when it gets cold. Bedding is going to change with the season, and uh, with cattle, at least a lot of the individuals I'm working with, we're feeding uh, calves, calves in the fall, maybe yearlings, uh, to get another turn through there. Uh, when we bring them in in the fall, we're dealing with uh, smaller calves, probably start them out on a, a little bit uh, less hot diet in terms of nutrients and so forth. Um, it's normally dry. Um, the bedding is the highest quality we're going to have each year. So that we're probably going to start out with using, utilizing the least amount at that time. As uh, winter goes on, hopefully the calves are growing. The quality of the bedding is still good. We will have the, the occasional snowstorms that come through and big openings on our buildings will allow uh, some of that to come in. We need to adjust and then increase the amount of bedding when that happens. Uh, spring, we're dealing now with bigger cattle. Normally, if we have some uh, rain or so forth, the bedding is going to be wet, so part of its usefulness has already been used up. We have that thaw period and high humidity, so we're not going to get the, the evaporation, and we do get the frequent rains. So again, we're going to have to adjust our bedding upward. Now, uh, the last one is summer, and I put this on here for the people that have changed from a open feedlot to a bedded barn. They tell me that the biggest thing that was a aha moment in terms of it is you use more bedding in the summer than you did the fall and winter, which is the exact opposite. If you bedded in an open lot, you bedded during the winter, but you never did anything during the summer. With these facilities, to keep things moving. One, you've got great big cattle, you've got hot conditions, the cattle are drinking more, some of the uh, feed ingredients we have may contain some additional sodium, some additional things that cause the animals to drink more. More drinking is going to produce more urine, needs to be soaked up. And often at the very end of the feeding period we're dealing with deterioration deteriorated bedding, it's pretty much used up. So they'll oftentimes use 50% more bedding in the summer than they do in the winter, and they did not expect that to be um, when they started out with the facility. Uh, deep pits, um, they're going to be under the, the slats. Um, when you looked at back to where we were in terms of how much manure you're producing. If you have a 8 to 10 foot pit, you're going to have to pump that out twice a year in order to have the storage that you need to keep the cattle in there. Uh, and I don't see anybody that's putting in a deep enough pit to make it through one year. So you're going to plan on doing that. It will tend to be more consistent and you're going to be able to capture that and put that through. When you think about building the building with something that you're going to be in there at least weekly, probably bi-weekly to uh, clean, okay, and oftentimes with the cattle in there, we need to make sure that we've got curbs so that we can scrape along the edges, make it easy to get done. Uh, push walls for loading up that manure, maybe where we're going to place our manure spreader so we can put that all together. Um, and then also maybe some extra mirrors on the thing so you can monitor where that cattle are. Oftentimes we're moving forward, slamming the uh, tractor into reverse after we've loaded up a load. And oftentimes we're not looking back where those cattle, as they especially get accustomed to the equipment, might be very, very close to you and end up bumping. Uh, here's a push wall. Um, 
And it, I, when I talk about push walls, this is going to be a reinforced concrete wall that you can push the loader into it and not worry about breaking anything. Okay. And when you think about uh, the equipment that you're going to use for uh, for buildings, since these buildings are going to last, what, 30, 40 years? Look at the equipment that you would like to own, not the equipment that you now have. Is it? How many of you guys want to buy a smaller tractor? No hands. Oh, there's a couple hands. Somebody wants one. Anyway, so make sure you, have, you reinforce it so that you, you won't have the problems. And think about the individual you might hire that doesn't have any experience with the tractor that might hit the, the top of the push wall uh, when he slips the, his foot off the clutch. Uh, here's, here is a nice curve along this edge, and you will be moving back and forth along there. And think about, especially when you get down into the really tight ones where there's enough room for the cattle to get back away from it. Angie. If you guys want to know how big that is, Angie's right there as our, uh, as our marker. Um, as far as storage, inside the building versus out. Inside the building, of course, it's going to be expensive, but it's very convenient um, to have some storage inside the building. You're probably not going to put it very much there, but uh, having a couple weeks is uh, nice. Uh, it's under roof. It's also going to be in a place where you're going to capture everything. Um, you can also put it just outside. Nice uh, push walls here also can contain it makes it convenient so you can get the job done even when the weather conditions are poor outside and you need to be able to do this in all weather conditions with barns. Okay, if we move that off site and uh, oftentimes we'll have both but move it away from the barn uh, to the field where it's going to be utilized. Uh, it is a second place to manage uh, and there may be regulations and community standards and I'll just say I get calls each year somebody says they don't want to smell it next to their house so they moved it out to the field where I'm at um, and even if it doesn't quote unquote breed flies it will attract flies and all I say is don't put it in front of the person's house and we've had that happen but it does help it. Normally the uh, fields adjacent to our facilities have high nutrient contents. Those fields that are out a long ways away could really use the P and the K that we are able to capture from that. Um, managing it, make sure that we're not losing it to the, the ground. Uh, keep it high and dry. Um, do not stockpile in the grass waterway and minimize the time that it's out there where we can have losses.